All right, so moving on to, pep I'm calling them add-on peptides, right? Um, number one, KPV. KPV as a peptide is a tripeptide. So tripeptide are part of that oligo um, uh, peptides, right? The ones that are between two and 20 or 21 amino acids that I mentioned at the beginning. Meaning, so tripeptide, meaning there's three amino acids that are chained together, right? And then there could be um, uh, dipeptides, so, so like two amino acids, tripeptides, and, and, and so on. So it's a tripeptide, and it is derived from alpha MSH. It is essentially a fragment that's produced or that's part of the alpha MSH um, complex. And because of that, it has many of the benefits of MSH. The one thing that it doesn't do, and it's actually a good thing, it doesn't lead to skin pigmentation. So for those of you who don't know, just in case, um, right, MSH, one of the things that it does in our body, in our skin, is induce skin pigmentation. So when you're exposed to sunlight, MSH creates that reaction where you get tan. This is actually a good thing. We don't want a peptide that's, if we start taking, especially in high dose, to start ramping up our skin pigmentation because that can actually uh, put us at risk of uh, things like uh, skin cancer, potentially. Um, and, and there are some anecdotal stories about this, not with KPB, but with other peptides that do a similar thing. And I'll mention them at the end. Um, so, so it doesn't have that, but it seems to have many of the other benefits that MSH provides for our bodies. It doesn't seem to directly stimulate MSH in the brain. I tried to look into this and there's, it's kind of up in the air. It's not fully clear if um, if, uh, if, if KPV is directly stimulating MSH, I think my sense is that it doesn't seem to do it in, in any direct fashion. So it seems to act more as a replacement for missing MSH in the blood. So I like to think of that as a thyroid medication. If you have missing, missing thyroid, right, you take a thyroid med like T3 or T4, and that replaces the missing thyroid, but it doesn't do anything to your thyroid itself. It doesn't heal your thyroid problem. It's just like um, compensating for that. Um, like I said, it may or may not indirectly. So at, maybe at best, it may indirectly promote MSH production because of what, you know, it's kind of like a vicious cycle. If you introduce MSH into your bloodstream, it's going to have benefits on your brain potentially in terms of the inflammation and that itself can allow normal msh to be produced and you know this could be uh taken there's there's different methods of of, of administration there's uh ivs but there's this also product called kpv ultra it's by a company called integrator peptides i have no affiliations with them but they're the only people who are producing an oral spray version of it that's very accessible it's it's very you know available you can order it yourself um and i've been using kpv ultra myself personally so maybe i'll talk a little bit about my experience with with kpv ultra um so far so yeah this is probably the most uh accessible and 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 um uh, uh optimal version of kpv out there right now and um it's pretty clean i think it only has like some essential oils like peppermint and it doesn't have any strange uh ingredients i'm looking at it right now here as i'm uh it has purified water it does have citric acid i haven't had any issues with that um it does have stevia and it has peppermint essential oil, sodium citrate, and I can't, oh, potassium sorbate. Those are the ingredients. I personally, I'm a very hyper sensitive person, although I'm, I'm a lot better these days, but um, I haven't had any issues with that product and the ingredients personally. So what are some of the potential benefits of KPV? Um, I'm going to base this first on what we have from published research. Really, the, the little research that's out there for KPV 
in terms of as a treatment is that it, it's been shown to help manage inflammation in the gut, very often associated with inflammatory bowel diseases. So this could be, um, you know, ulcer, ulcerative colitis or, or even Crohn's, but more generally just gut related problems where there's a lot of inflammation. Um, this is where there's been the most research published specifically of KPV. So if you're one of those people, um, I mean, a lot of us have gut issues anyways, right? But certainly if you're in the category of diagnosed autoimmune disorder in your gut, um, so th that's where uh, I think, right, a lot of this research is coming from. If there's some research uh, documenting its antimicrobial and antifungal properties. And this is again coming from MSH, and maybe I should take a moment here to, to reference a previous workshop that I did on MSH. And one of the things that MSH does for you is um, keep your, you know, so going back to this, it keeps your the junctions of your gut nice and tight. So, right, if you have low MSH, you're much more prone to what we call leaky gut. And it's not a problem in the gut. It's a problem in the brain. It's a signaling problem. If we go back to the definition of, of peptides. It's a signaling problem that's causing leaky gut. And with that can come things like dysbiosis, essentially, right? SIBO, candida overgrowth, and things like that, right? Once you have leaky gut, that's promoting a terrain for that kind of stuff to happen. And MSH is really important at keeping those things at bay, making sure that those things don't happen. So very often when SIRS patients are experiencing those issues, a candida issue, they think they have a fungal issue, it could very well just be due to the low MSH, or at least that's that could be one of the contributors. Uh, but so KPV happens to have those antimicrobial benefits that MSH provides. So that's a great thing. That's a really good thing because we can take advantage of, of that. And Again, it's not like we have um, amazing research, documented research showing this in different contexts, but in principle, there's some enough information to suggest that this is this is a part of what KPV can do for us. So let's put this more in an anecdotal context, and I'm going to refer to myself here now um, uh, in terms of potential benefits. So I've been taking KPV now for maybe like a month and a half now. I've actually took it, I've taken, I've had two trials. I did a trial when I was in LA for a couple of weeks and then I stopped and then I went back to it when I moved to New Mexico. And I've been, I've been on it now consistently for, like I said, a month and a half. So what are some of the things that I've experienced personally? And I've also seen this in other people that I know that are taking KPV. Um, certainly I've, I've, I've noticed a significant decrease in, in reactivity to the environment. Um, it's It's been certainly a, a big moving needle for me in that sense. Um, I've, I've noticed tremendous histamine reduction, like, like big time. Um, I suspect that my histamine issue is primarily in the gut. So if the source of histamine is coming primarily from the gut, this may be something that could help people. Um, I've certainly, notice more improved food tolerance, even though my diet right now is very limited. I I'm now eating a, a class of foods that prior would trigger a lot of histamine issues. And now I'm, I'm not experiencing those symptoms with that. Um, and then could potentially help with thyroid issues. It it's helped my thyroid issues. I've tried, um, thyroid meds because I've always had some weird hypothyroid issues going on, but I, I've never responded to the thyroid medications. I, I also took, you know, supplements like selenium and things like that, and they kind of helped, but they were quite not there. So I started taking this and I finally started feeling like my temperature issues, like I was very intolerant to, um, to the cold, uh, especially, um, those things started to normalize, um, certainly improve energy that I think it may be tied to the thyroid. So um, that's been very helpful. And what that tells me is that maybe my thyroid issues are coming from an MSH deficiency rather than the thyroid itself. Something to think about in your case. 
And because of the antimicrobial activity and because what we know about MSH, it may help keep Marcon's in check, right? So these are, I can't speak to myself personally uh, about, about myself in this regard, but in theory, it may be something that, that could help uh, on the search front. So let's try to apply this into context. So which, which patients could benefit and when? I think that's really important. So we wanna think about those questions or when to use KPV in the context of the pyramid, the Shoemaker protocol. So the cases where I think are probably more likely to have success with something like KPV is you've been, you've been on step three, you've been doing Marcons, you know, you've ruled out, you're out of exposure, you've been on binders, you pass your BCS test and you're dealing with Marcons and you maybe you cleared it, but it keeps coming back. It's like very stubborn, right? That might be a situation where maybe introducing KPV could maybe help your body make a push to try to seal the deal with Marcons or just keep it at bay. You do want to make sure that you're ruling out dental problems because sometimes stubborn cases of Marcons is because, not because of, the sinuses, but the source is somewhere else. And usually that could be in the dental uh, site. Um, another situation, if you have st a stubborn case of low MSH, again, this spike theory mark on, so let's say you've cleared mark on, you've cleared the first three steps, but you still have low MSH. Maybe that's another uh, place where you can introduce KPV as an add-on add -on to sort of facilitate the process of calming down the hyperreactivity from the innate immune system, and maybe that would in turn help promote MSH. If you're having very stubborn cases of histamine, you know, assuming you've addressed, again, the first three steps and you, you've been trying to address other possible sources, but you're still having some histamine issues that you wanna manage, this could potentially help on that front. If you have a stubborn case of candida overgrowth, um, again, where you've been dealing with all these steps of the protocol and you're still showing some evidence of candida overgrowth, KPV may be worth trying to see if it, if it helps clear the candida. And like I said earlier, thyroid issues, if you're not responding to standard medications, um, certainly worth talking to your practitioner about that and see if the MSH helps normalize. You know, the way I would go about this is if you have any abnormal thyroid markers, I would run the experiment, do, you know, a period of, of KPB, maybe for a month, two or three months, and then test your thyroid labs, see what's happening there. If you see some normalization of your thyroid, again, that could be indicative that your thyroid problem may be coming from low MSH or dysregulation of the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. Uh, another case where this could be potentially beneficial, if you're one of the people who carry a low MSH haplotype, which is the 1.5, maybe this is one of those things that you, even when you complete the, the, the Shoemaker protocol, um, you might want to have around because, you know, you, you, you may very well bring your MSH up, but maybe not as high as you would want it to. Let's say it's in the low 20s, which is great. But if you want to go for like a 30 or above 30, maybe adding KPV could help you reach those levels in your blood. And then with, you know, tied to that, the, the other context really where I think this could be potentially useful is if you've completed the Shoemaker protocol, you know, you're just trying to manage residual symptoms on a long-term basis, or you're just trying to improve like quality post-surge treatment and you just want to have a very ideal MSH level circulating in your blood and that makes you feel better and everything else is, is looking okay in principle it should be okay um again i'm I mean, i'm, I'm going to repeat this i know some people have jumped in started it came in a little bit late you know I'm, I'm not talking about this from the perspective of practitioner or medical advice this is something you really need to talk to your practitioner about so think about because we don't have a lot of research to really indicate what are the potential you know risks associated with these peptides it do, it seems to be the case that kpv is relatively safe and in general a lot of these peptides seem to be relatively safe for most people but again i'm saying that with a 
grain of salt. We don't have enough data to make very strong conclusive statements about that. So you may be working with a practitioner who has experience with, with peptides and you want to find out what their, what their, uh, you know, what their experience has been. And they might have like dozens or hundreds of patients where they've been trying some peptides. And so they'll have a track record of how safe or how risky it is to take a given peptide. So this is with respect to KPV. I think these are the contexts where are the most applicable or have the, the greater promise um, for a SERS patient.